This is Anna Kasparian, host and executive producer of The Young Turks, the largest online progressive news show in the world. Today's episode is brought to you by Naked Wines. Here's a dirty little secret. The wine industry wants to create as much distance between you and the winemaker as possible. Scandalous, we know. And it ends up costing you money in the end because they fill all that space with markups, fees, and price-raising middlemen. In fact, by the time you buy it, it's likely that they've sold that same bottle of wine twice or even three times before. Naked Wines connects you directly to the world's best independent winemakers and their award-winning wines. So you can cut out the middlemen and get great wines at an honest price, up to 60% off, in fact. Take back control of the way you wine and get closer to the winemaker. Find out more and try the new way to wine at us.nakedwines.com slash podcast. Drink responsibly and be sure to listen to The Young Turks on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Katie Stallard, Senior Editor, China and Global Affairs in Washington, D.C. I'm Emily Tampkin, Senior Editor, U.S. in Washington, D.C. I'm Jeremy Cliff, writer at large in Berlin. It's Thursday, the 28th of July. You're listening to World Review from the New Statesman, a twice weekly international news podcast. Every Monday, we interview a guest for their unique perspective and expertise. Then, later in the week, we come together to unpack some of the most significant stories in world affairs. This week, the fallout from Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi's resignation. In light of the vote expressed yesterday evening, I am asking to suspend the session because I'm going to the president to inform him of my intentions to resign. Is the far right about to take power in Rome? Then we turn to US Speaker Nancy Pelosi's potential trip to Taiwan. Well, I I, I think that the military thinks it's not a good idea right now, but uh, I, I don't know what the status of it is. How will China respond? Thank you for joining us. Let's begin. Jeremy, it is, as always, great to have you on the pod to talk about. It's, oh, well, it's, it's great to have you on the podcast to talk about no matter what, but it is especially great when we get to have you to talk about European politics. So thank you for joining us today. Good to be here. All right, let's let's get right into it. So Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi resigned after roughly a year and a half of overseeing Italy's caretaker government. Italy is now poised to head to early elections, and the far right could be positioned to come to power. Jeremy, let's just back up a little bit. Why did he resign? Right. So the question here, as always with Italian politics, is how far do you back up? Because you, you, we could back up weeks or months or maybe even decades. Um, I think a good place to start is February 2021, when Draghi came to power. And he came to power at the head of the third government Italy seen since its last election in 2018. And unlike the others, this was a national unity government spanning basically the whole political spectrum. There are various moving parts, so bear with me here. But this, the, the four main players of this government were the centre-left, the Five Star Movement, which is a sort of populist movement quite hard to place on a left-right spectrum, and then two parties of the right, Silvio Berlusconi's Forza Italia, which is a sort of amalgam of populism and mainstream conservatism, and then the far-right Lega Party. Very strange beast, but it was, it was, it was brought together by the personality and by the charisma and the respect that goes to Mario Draghi, the former president of the European Central Bank, widely credited with saving the single currency during the worst of the Eurozone crisis a decade ago, um, and widely respected in Italy and indeed in Europe. And that the job of this new government was to um, oversee Italy's recovery from the COVID pandemic, and particularly the disbursement of the billions of euros in support that Italy's received from the European Union under its very ambitious um, recovery package. Now, this government held together, as you say, for about 18 months, but the strains were already showing, particularly those populist parties, the Lega on the right and the Five Star bridled at some of these policies. The Five Star in particular, who'd come first in the 2018 election, had been slumping in the polls in Italy. Part of the party splintered off into a new party about a month ago. And basically, they decided about two weeks ago to hold up a vote on a major spending package, 23 billion euros. And the way they did this was to basically say they wouldn't participate in a confidence vote in Draghi's government. Now, that initially prompted him to go to the Italian president and try to resign. The president said, no, you have to go back and form a new majority. And then 
the following week, so last week as we record this, the two right-wing parties, so Berlusconi Sforza and the far-right Lega party, decided to join Five Star in refusing to give confidence to the government and basically bringing it down. And that was what led to last Thursday, 21st of July, Draghi again submitting his resignation, but this time it being accepted given the absence of any governing alternative. So that means we're going to see a, a new election in Italy on the 25th of September. And it seems, I mean, it seems at least to me that every headline since this has happened has been, oh my goodness, the far right is coming. They're at the gates. This is what's next for, for Italian politics. Why? Is it just that they're ahead in the polls? Is it the particular constellation of figures and how they're going to come together? What, what, what's going on there? Right. So to understand this, I need to bring in a fifth party and bring such is in. Italian politics, I'm afraid. But I've mentioned the four, th- <laughs> the four that were in Draghi's government, which was broad enough as it was. But the one major party that, that sat outside it was Fratelli d'Italia, Brothers of Italy, which is described as quite accurately as being post-fascist. You know, it, it, it grew out of a party that grew out of a party that grew out of Mussolini's fascist movement. So there's a sort of family tree there that goes right the way back to Mussolini's fascism. Now, they protest that today they're more moderate, but there are some very, very far right elements in this party. And, and indeed, in the career and in the personality and in the outlook of Giorgia Meloni, its leader, who now looks set to become Italy's next prime minister. She would do so at the head of a, of a right-wing coalition. Her party, the Brothers of Italy, have soared in the polls since 2018. They've gone from about, I think it was 4% in that election, to around 23 24% in the polls. Now that puts them in first place. And it seems that they're going to run on a joint slate with the Lega, the other far-right party, and Berlusconi's Forza, a little bit more to the center, but still very populist, in a sort of right-wing alliance. And that alliance currently looks set for victory, not not least because the rest of the political spectrum is so fragmented. And that that would, it seems, put Meloni as the leader of the largest of those three parties, Brothers of Italy, in the job of prime minister. I can imagine, particularly the people listening to this podcast, hearing this and thinking, okay, post-fascist, it comes from Mussolini's party, and there's far-right elements to it. What about this is, is post? Can you tell us a bit more about Maloney and what makes her, I mean, she's clearly a compelling figure to many. Um, what is, what's, what's at the core of that? I know you've written about her. We have a piece, we'll put the link in the show notes, but if you could just speak a bit more about her character and, and this persona and personality. Right. Okay. So what, what about it is post-fascist? Well, the remnants of the Italian fascist party after the Second World War formed a party called the Italian Social Movement, the MSI, which was a, a quite a, a, a major force on the hard right of Italian politics, the far right of Italian politics in the post-war years, and indeed had links to far right terrorism in the so-called um, years of lead in the 1970s, which saw a kind of a period of political violence in Italy. So really very, very extreme as in you know, links to people blowing up or assassinating supposed left-wing opponents. They tried to moderate or sort of moderate their image to the point where they basically formed a new party in 1995 called the National Alliance. And then the National Alliance ultimately folded into Silvio Berlusconi's Forza in 2009. The right-wing fringe of that party then broke off in 2012 to form Brothers of Italy. And that's the party you see today. Now, I, I tell this genealogy because I think it gives you a sense of the, first of all, quite how direct the genealogical relationship is with Italian fascism. It is, you know, it is the grandfather of, of Brothers of Italy. But it's important also because of Giorgia Maloney herself and the, and the others around her in in the party's leadership, because she came up in the Italian social movement, the MSI, that party formed in the immediate post-war years. I mean, she's obviously younger than that, but she was in that party. She became then part of the National Alliance. She was briefly a, a junior minister under Berlusconi, and then she was one of the founders of Brothers of Italy. So she's been part of that story all the way through. And if you look at a lot of her positions today, Yes, she has sanitized the party's image in in a way, but she still has effectively endorsed the, the so-called great replacement theory, the, this this far right conspiracy theory about white populations supposedly being replaced by migrants. Her party still today has an extreme policy on migration. Its instincts are very much Eurosceptic, even if it acknowledges that there is no appetite in Italy to leave the Euro or the European Union at the moment. Its social policies are very right wing. And indeed, and, and, and it is part of that hard right, that far right ecosystem in Italy, in which, frankly, the divide between the mainstream and the radical right is blurred even by the 
international standards of our troubled times uh, these days. So I think there is there is quite a lot to worry about there. Meloni has helped sanitize the party's image. She would be part of a coalition, and there's only a certain amount that an Italian government can get done anyway these days. But the, but that should not detract from the fact that it comes from a very, very dark place in Italian politics. I also have two questions, and it, it's fascinating to hear your takes on this, Jeremy. My first is, and I, I've thought about how to put this delicately, um, and I will just go ahead and ask it. To what extent is this Italian politics just being Italian politics? And could Giorgia Maloney be the next leader of a failed government and this just be more, you know, more churn? And to what extent is there a danger that she could really do things that have long-term consequences? Like I've, I've heard some talk about, you know, could she muster, for instance, enough of a majority to amend the constitution? I mean, what do you think? Is this is this business as usual in Italy or is this something really serious to be concerned about? This is exactly the big question. And I think there are arguments on both sides. Some of the instincts and some of, indeed of the stated policies of Brothers of Italy, not to mention the Lega, which is in some respects at least as radical, in some respects perhaps even more radical, are very, very extreme by uh, conventional European standards. I mean, for example, one of the other policies that they've mooted is that they propose the the legal supremacy of the Italian constitution over EU law, which is something that Poland's politicized court system flirted with in the autumn and would, if actually enacted, spell the, the collapse of the European Union and, it, and its legal order. So that is very worrying. As I say, the party's quote unquote post-fascist heritage is very worrying. But my view, and I put this, I tried to put this as in, in as qualified a way as I could in the piece that I wrote, which as Emily says will, will be in the show notes, is that it is not new that there is an extremely porous divide between the Italian mainstream and the Italian hard right even by the standards of Western politics today. Nor is it new to have governments coming in proposing radical, drastic, transformative change. Now, the evidence to date suggests that those governments rarely muster even a fraction of what they promise. The, the Italian political system is very sclerotic. But Italian politics is very instable. I mean, huge, there is a huge amount of movement, for example, between different party groups in the Italian parliament. So what, what's elected at one election often has no resemblance to the state of the parliament by the end of that political term. And, and, and I think that, you know, that there have been past cases, most notably 2018, when the first of those three governments that have that have governed Italy since, since the last election came to power. That was a, that was an example of basically an all populist government of the Lega and the Five Star Movement, which caused huge, huge worry in in, in, in Brussels. And, you know, the, it was speculated in the press that it could bring down the European Union. It could turn Italy into a sort of a bigger version of Hungary and so forth. Now, it did some very bad things, but it did not manage anything re remotely resembling that. And I think that overall, I think that the Italian electorate does, as much as it lurches between different political forces and different political personalities, does prefer a certain amount of stability. It recognises that the Italian economy, with its vast debt burden, is very dependent on goodwill from Brussels and Frankfurt. And such is the instability that it very quickly reshapes the picture relatively soon after a government's come together. So I think, you know, Italy has a, there are a lot of things to be worried about about Italy, but my, my general view is that its problems are more chronic than acute. The long-term stagnation in real incomes, the long-term trend of its youngest talented people leaving the country, the long-term trend of political instability and dysfunction. Now, those are things that should really worry us, but they're not things that suddenly kind of transform with a new government coming or going. I mean, in, in some ways, that's that's the sad truth about it. And in fact, even Draghi, on whom all of these hopes were placed when he came to power 18 months ago, has not as achieved as much as many would have hoped because the system is, I mean, it is, I think, a bit like wading through syrup, trying to do anything, you know, with the leaders of power in Italy, which is unfortunate when it's a government that many would regard as more reformist and progressive. It's, it's less unfortunate when it's a government that might do ill if it were at the power of a more dynamic and responsive political machine. So... I think one has to strike a balance. A lot to be worried about short term in terms of what, what such a government could do. But I, I do tend to the side of the argument that sees Italy's problems as being more long term, more endemic than kind of catastrophic. One brief follow up is what would a Maloney government mean beyond Italy? What would this mean sort of more broadly for the Eurozone and perhaps specifically for the war in Ukraine? 
Definitely bad news. I mean, Draghi has made has been one of the strongest voices in the EU for arming Ukraine, for giving he played a leading role in the move to give Ukraine accession status to the EU. And he also gave Italy important credibility when it came to debates on the future of the Eurozone, for example. You know, there is there is an ongoing debate in, in Brussels about future fiscal rules. You know, there is the possibility or there has been in the last year or so of the EU shifting to what I would see as a a more sane fiscal order that is less obsessed with kind of um, strict budget rules and allows the investment that a lot of countries, including Italy, need. And Draghi was positive because I think he bought confidence in the northern states, most obviously Germany, for those sorts of changes and those sorts of reforms. And so the fact that he's going is bad news and the fact that he's likely to be replaced by Maloney is bad news in terms of Ukraine. And it's bad news in terms of um, the EU's fiscal order. Very brief final point. Maloney, a lot of people are kind of calling this kind of a great win for Putin. And of course it is, because it, an important country in Europe will be less well-governed and will be less instinctively progressive and liberal and Western. However, Maloney has always struck a more Atlanticist foreign policy tone than the Lega, the, that other far-right Italian party that I mentioned under Matteo Salvini. I think it's drawn to the sort of strongman imagery of Putin's leadership. She has personally quite close relationship with the Republicans in the US and has, for example, supported weapons deliveries to Ukraine, even though she's outside of the government, of Dr- Draghi's government. Now, that's not to say that it's not worrying in, in, in foreign policy terms, but I guess that that is something that might temper some of our most pessimistic scenarios about where this will put Italy on the European geopolitical map under a Maloney government. All right. And now we are going to travel far afield. We're heading maybe to Taiwan. Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, is reportedly planning to visit Taiwan next month. Her potential visit has sparked warnings from Beijing and worries in Washington. Katie, what's going on here? Why why is Nancy Pelosi going to Taiwan right now? Maybe, reportedly. (laughs) Right. This is a very complex issue, which has not been served well by being apparently discussed uh, day to day in the headlines here in the US um, with kind of repeated reports day after day as to whether Pelosi is going to Taiwan, what Beijing has threatened to do if she does, whether Biden thinks it's it's a good idea. Um, I think the first thing to say is that this would have been a much, much, much better discussion to have privately and quietly. But we are where we are. Um, she was supposed to be visiting in April. That was postponed because she um, got the coronavirus. And then we got reports what, just over a week ago now that she plans to go in August. So like Italian politics, we can we can go back decades here. So to, to be as kind of mercifully brief as I can be, the relationship between the US and China is currently at its lowest point in decades. It is, it is particularly fraught. Washington does not have formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan. It switched its recognition from Taipei to Beijing in 1979. And the US has long abided by what's known as the One China Policy, which recognizes Beijing as the sole government of China and acknowledges China's position that Taiwan is part of its territory without endorsing that claim. So it effectively says, I understand that you see it that way. This has been a very difficult, well, a a diplomatic minefield uh, for decades now, which which successive US presidents have tried to navigate around uh, carefully, some with greater success than others. But essentially, the, the US is obliged under the Taiwan Relations Act to provide Taiwan with the means to defend itself, but it has long resisted going further than that under the policy of strategic ambiguity the US has traditionally avoided saying whether US troops would be involved in defending Taiwan militarily. Three times in the last 12 months, Joe Biden has appeared to break with that by stating explicitly that the US would defend Taiwan. Most recently, he did that in May. Each time, White House aides have come out straight away afterwards and said he is not changing policy towards Taiwan. Um, He's just speaking off script, pay no heed uh, to the remarks of of the president, but Beijing does not see it that way. Um, There is very serious concern among Chinese government officials that the US is now salami slicing, consistently undercutting this one China policy and that it's making moves to encourage 
Taiwan's independence, which is the, the reddest of red lines for the Chinese government. So all of which is to say this has been moving slowly towards what, what could be a real crisis point between the US and China, with Chinese officials really concerned that the US is shifting away from this longstanding policy and, and really wanting to show how seriously they take this. And then the news that Speaker Pelosi plans to visit in August is in danger of bringing this to a head. So there, there is a precedent for a speaker to go there. Gingrich did so in 1997, 25 years ago, but this would be the first time in a quarter of a century that someone of her seniority has visited, and it comes at a particularly sensitive time from China's perspective. So bearing in mind everything that I've just said about how unhappy they are with the way the situation is developing, if you had then to pick a time for a very senior US official to visit, um, August is very bad timing. It's when the Chinese leadership traditionally goes into their annual conclave. They they withdraw to this uh, the seaside resort of, of Beidehe generally in August to plan for the, the Congress that is coming this autumn. It is particularly important this year because she is expected to seek a third term as president, which would be the first time in decades that a leader has done that. So it is a particularly sensitive time from his point of view. It's also the anniversary of the founding of the People's Liberation Army. So it's a moment of particular celebration of Chinese military strength. So the danger and the real concern here is that if the visit goes ahead in August with all of these other considerations, China may feel the need to do something quite demonstrative. We should be clear, China is as concerned as the US is in not sparking a conflict here. But all of the warnings that Chinese officials are giving in terms of, you know, they're talking about forceful measures. They're talking about resolute measures. The Chinese Ministry of Defense yesterday talked about the Chinese military not sitting by idly while this goes ahead. There are warnings from more eccentric, more radical voices like Hu Sijin, the former editor of, of the Tabloid Global Times, who's calling, for instance, for Beijing to declare a no-fly zone over Taiwan or to send Chinese fighter jets to intercept Pelosi's plane, which would likely be a US military aircraft. It's very unlikely that that is the path they're going to take. But nevertheless, there are growing calls now from within China to make some very serious demonstration of force here. And then, you know, the danger is that that calibration is not managed correctly and that this, you know, that we see a near aerial encounter or that we see both sides misjudge where the other's red line is here. I think there are some who listening to this could say, all right, maybe it's, it's not worth it for her to go. But on the other hand, the U.S. isn't invading Taiwan. This is a, a right. person coming to visit. And so China, you know, demonstrating force because a woman has landed in Taiwan is perhaps not a show of Chinese security, but of their own, not to be like a hawkish or, or self-centered American about this. It sounds ridiculous that like you need to put on a show of force because of the Speaker of the House came to Taiwan. So what is the response? So I spoke to an analyst yesterday who described this vis visit now as like a Rorschach test for US-China policy. So the way he explained it was, you know, China hawks see this as, well, why wouldn't she go? Particularly against the backdrop of the war in Ukraine, it is more than important than ever that the US signals very strong support for Taiwan and does everything it can to deter any thoughts of, of military action from Beijing of course she should go. And we're now seeing explicitly, you know, Newt Gingrich has come out and said uh, she should not be timid. Of course she could, of course she should go. Former Secretary of State Mike, Mike, Mike Pompeo has volunteered to go with her. Republican Ben Sass is saying no feebleness, uh, no self-deterrence. Of course she should go. There are strong calls that of course she should go. And also it's important to say, you know, Taipei government on Taiwan says that they don't have formal details of the visit, but that they would absolutely welcome it, that it would be a strong show of US support for Taiwan. Said against that, the other side of the argument is, of course, she is within her rights to go, but she should think very carefully about going now, what she will achieve in terms of what the risks are, and those risks and the consequences will be borne primarily by Taiwan. There are other ways to demonstrate US resolve and US deterrence without having the speaker fly to Taiwan amid all of these other considerations. So I, I think from the more sort of, I hesitate to call it dovish side, because I don't think this is actually a, 
a dovish view, I think it's quite a reasonable view, is that we should be wary of just making very kind of demonstrative, declarative visits that will attract lots of lots of headlines. Whereas actually, you know, we we could be having much less exciting um, conversations about the kinds of arms that that Taiwan needs. So there are ways to show support for Taiwan without necessarily doing it next month. But the danger in having this conversation out loud is that it has no, you know, the argument is being made particularly by Republicans, that if she doesn't go, that will show that China has deterred the US and that China's threats work. And that will encourage more of what we've seen. You know, the, the last few days have just been filled with Chinese officials of uh, filling the airwaves of, of you know really blood curdling threats of what will happen if the US goes ahead with this. So that's why it's so I think problematic to be having this discussion out loud and why it would have been much more productive to do this probably in in a more quiet and measured way behind the scenes. Katie, you you've written about the domestic difficulties facing the Chinese Communist Party this year, you know, from the 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 nightmare of the zero covid strategy a slowing economy growing concerns about chinese demographics the crisis of the property sector a lot of autocrats and that's what xi jinping is ultimately in such situations would look to some sort of foreign policy distraction do you see that domestic picture playing into bellicosity if not t- towards taiwan i should say if not before his confirmation for a a historic third term in the autumn than then next year or in 2024, in the in the near future, shall we say? I think there is an argument, and it's important to be clear that she himself, whenever he has talked about this, uses a very specific phrasing, which is that time and momentum are on China's side. He has been very clear to specify that while they're not ruling out the use of force, that's not their first option. There is an argument to be made that the greater the challenges are at home, the less likely she would be to resist what would be, apart from anything else, just a catastrophic economic undertaking from, from China's point of view. You know, there was a very, very real question about, you know, militarily in terms of just the raw capabilities. Could China do this, particularly given what we've seen with the Russian offensive in Ukraine? You know, this is an invasion that would need to take place across 100 kilometers of water and an attack on an island you know this would this is no small undertaking militarily but just beyond that in terms of the politics and the economics she would be risking a really core plank of the communist party's legitimacy in terms of the idea that it's bringing stability prosperity development and I, i've heard this argument both ways that on the one hand he is very much thinking about his histor- his historical legacy and he wants to be the leader who got Taiwan back as as Beijing sees it, although it's important to say that the CCP has never actually governed Taiwan. But he also doesn't want to be the leader who makes a catastrophic error and ruins China's development trajectory. So I think the greater danger, and we have seen a lot of talk in recent months about the timetable. You know, this really started back in 2021 with the the former head of US Indopaycom saying that he thought there were really six years of, of really core concern about a Chinese invasion of, of Taiwan, which takes us to 2027. I've seen a lot of variations of late of, of, you know, really this is the decade of concern because China's military capabilities will be reaching the point where the, this is at least a possible option, whereas it hasn't been before. But I think it's less that he has a timetable that he would seek to move on and launch, you know, what would be very, very, very risky undertaking. More the greater danger, and I think this plays into some of the reactions we're seeing around talk of Pelosi's visit, is that he doesn't want to be the leader who loses Taiwan. So if he made a judgment that Taiwan, you know, Taiwan has presidential elections too in 2024, as we do here in the United States, I think the greater danger comes post then, if he perceived that Taiwan was now on a trajectory where, you know, the the old plan was like Hong Kong, It was going to be one country, two systems. Taiwan would be able to come back nominally under Beijing's control, but with its own system of democratic freedoms. Hong Kong has proved absolutely 100% that is not an option. And public opinion on Taiwan is moving away from that. You know, the younger generation on Taiwan, it does, you know, understandably, does not want to even countenance a discussion about one country, two systems under Beijing. So I think the danger here 
is that if she perceives that Taiwan is is moving irreconcilably from his orbit and that he faces the real prospect of being the leader who loses Taiwan, that's what might motivate him to take action. But I, you know, I think the one important thing to say is I think that one of the very few things the United States and China can currently agree on is that they want to avoid a conflict, if at all possible. So while you know we're seeing a lot of very chilling threats right now, one would hope that sensible heads on both sides will prevail you know, in terms of making sure that this is calibrated correctly and that this doesn't escalate in a, in a, you know, in a truly serious fashion. Wherever you are in the world, if you're interested in global affairs, you can subscribe to The New Statesman in digital, in print or both from as little as one pound a week. That's 12 weeks for just 12 pounds. That's one euro a week in Europe and just two dollars a week in America. Just go to www.newstatesman.com slash podcast offer. From the New Statesman comes a new podcast, Audio Long Reads. The best of our reported features and essays, read aloud. Featuring writing from our authors, including Ian McEwan on wrestling with Orwell's Inside the Whale. Might we reasonably assume that there is no longer an inside to the whale? That the creature lies stranded on the beach, as whales sometimes are? That the guts and blubber and ribcage are on display? A year inside GB News with Stuart McGurk. At first, the problems weren't ideological, but practical technical and quite, well, obvious. And Maria Wilczek on Belarusian football fans who took on Alexander Lukashenko. After the August 2020 protests, hundreds of ultras were roughed up and held in custody. One was later found dead in suspicious circumstances. Ease into the weekend with our audio long reads, published every Saturday morning. Just search audio long reads from the New Statesman wherever you get your podcasts. All right. Well, on that foreboding yet hopeful note, we are going to head to a section that we like to call You Ask Us. Uh, you Ask Us. <laughs> great. No, that was Sorry. good. That was great. great. <laughs> that's uh, that's on the just like that. Um, <laughs> Think of it yeah. as an echo rather than a chorus. <laughs> um, a couple of listeners wanted to know why Victor Orban's advisor resigned now. The now being, I think, the critical part of the, the question. So backing up a little bit, Victor Orban in Romania on the 23rd of July, gives this speech where he comes out against the mixing of races, mixed race societies, basically says that this is, this is the end of, you know, a country can't remain a country with mixed races. This gets a lot of attention, even though Viktor Orban has said very similar things in other speeches for years. Why does it get so much attention now? I mean, we can speculate personally. I think part of it is that he's going to be addressing CPAC, this conservative convention um, in Texas next month. And so it's sort of you know, the, the whole Orban and Hungarian right and American right nexus generated attention for it. Some on the right tried to pretend that we had just misunderstood and race just meant a difference. Like it's, it's, it didn't translate. And really he meant the, the mixing of different cultures. A couple things. First of all, that's nonsense. He's been quite clear for years that, like, uh, yes, maybe in Europe they do have a different understanding of race versus ethnicity versus culture. He's pretty clearly talking about maintaining homogeneous society. I don't care what label you put on it. That is the content. Second of all, his advisor and this person, Zuza Hegedus, who's been close to Hungarians, if I if you listen to this, I mispronounce that. My deepest apologies. This is a person who's known Orban for two decades, resigns, and basically said, this is Nazi speech. Now, why, why now? Why did, why did she resign now? I mean, we can, again, we can, we can really just speculate. Was this speech notably worse than what he had said in the past, honestly? And it is not to excuse the content of the speech at all. No, I, do, I think that this is pretty consistent with what he's been saying for the past seven years. But I will say that to put a charitable read on it, you know, she, Zuzah Hegel just said, look, my, my family is Jewish. Like this is the, this language hurt, decimated my family. And I, I guess I would say that I would hope that it's never too late in Hungary, in the United States, anywhere to have one's one's conscience shocked. And I, I wrote a piece on this that we'll put in the show notes. 
I think because there's this attack on civil rights through the courts right now, some saw this and thought, oh my goodness, there's going to be this convention and Orban's way to say something similar. And then Republicans are going to make a big push to overturn Loving versus Virginia, which is the Supreme Court decision from decades ago that allows us to have interracial marriage. I think more likely than that, well, I, I, in fact, I know more likely than that, is that you, you actually don't need to push for the overturning of any one decision to promote a society in which participation is based on your ethnicity or your race or your religion or your whatever, and not your desire to have civic participation. And I think that we're seeing that all the time uh, across policies. It's behind, you see it when people come out and say, oh, good, they're, they're banning abortion. This is good for white life. You see it when people say, oh, I need guns to protect my white family. You see it when they talk about immigration and when they talk about great replacement theory and say, well, they're, they're changing the nature of America. Like it's, it's already happening. It's already here. This language is not new. It's not new for Orban. It's not new for the right in the United States. And so, you know, once we get over our conscience being shocked, what are, what are we going to do about it? Anyway, Jeremy, I wanted to get thoughts from you. Very, very briefly, I, I get where the question is coming from. You know, you, you, you do look at this, this resignation and think, why did it take her this long to see that Orban was a sort of race baiting, authoritarian um, extremist, you know, given all of the evidence to date? And so I totally understand where the question is coming from. But then again, I don't think there's anything specifically Hungarian about this. There are, there are lots of examples around the world of previously mainstream parties raising anchor and sailing off towards the extremes and it taking supposedly moderate members of those of those parties a very long time to jump off and swim swim back to where they were if that ever happens most obvious example being the republican party in the us but obviously not the only one so i do think that's that's the way it is you know people political parties are social beings they're organic beings people have their personal connections and i think you know they're used to the identity of the party they're used to the people they know in the party they're used to the party leader and, and to defending that person or the, those people and i think to to break that habit is quite hard and a lot of people don't have the guts or the courage needed in these in these moments so i don't think it's specifically hungarian and of course fidesz is a perfect example of that it started off as a liberal democratic or a kind of moderate conservative party in the that grew out of the anti-communist movement orban's first government was was considered relatively mainstream by European standards almost 20 years ago now. And so I guess it's 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 an example of that. But I do say that, you know, just one final thought, you know, we had the election in Hungary early this year. It was a test of whether, you know, Hungarian democracy was too far gone. And I, I have a terrible feeling that it is. It would take some sort of shock now or some sort of major systemic change to break Orban's grip. The, the opposition gave it its best shot. They pulled together, they presented a candidate you know, in Peter Markidzai, who was precision engineered to pick off the sort of moderate Fidesz voters who might be offended by some of Orban's more extreme comments and, and, and positions. And that didn't work. And I think the very sad truth is that we have a, a, a country that really is and should be fundamental to the European system and to the European Union that is drifting further and further away. And I, I did start this year with a, a glimpse of optimism about Hungary. And I, I'm afraid to say that that's, that's no longer there. I have one brief follow up for Emily, which is just to say, do you think this in any way changes views here in the United States about Orban and causes a little bit of hesitation about jumping quite so enthusiastically towards him? Is there any sense like this is where the line is? To be cynical, I think that members of the American right who speak out on this will be doing so because he said the quiet part out loud. I think this is pretty fundamental to the project of the American right at this moment. So no, I, I, don't, I don't think they're going to say how could you? How could, how could he? How could they? You know, I, I wrote this in C for after CPAC Budapest. And they're, they're going global. You know, yes, the, these American right-wing figures appeared on stage with these Hungarian, you know, xenophobic anti-Semites. But the reverse also happened. <laughs> you know, like the, uh, Trump has also said outlandish, outrageous things. It's, it's sort of like who's, who's tarnishing whom? here so, so no i don't <laughs> that's a really that's a really depressing way of putting it but it's a really good, I, I good one it's who <laughs> I, yeah whose toxicity is so great that it rubs right, off exactly. of the other and i guess we'll yeah. we'll see more of that we'll see more of that next month is my my cynical prediction we have to leave it there we've already run quite long thanks for sticking with us and thanks to all of you who sent in your questions you can send yours in at podcasts at newstatesman.co.uk or by tweeting at us that's all the time we have for today. Join us on Monday for an interview with Gerald Knaus on the situation in Bosnia. 
a huge thank you once again to Jeremy for coming on and sharing his expertise and thoughts with us today. Thanks, Jeremy. Pleasure. Now, if you are a regular World Review listener, you can subscribe. And if you have already subscribed, thank you so much. Now, please also leave us five stars and leave us a nice review. It really does help. Our producer has been Mae Robson. Thank you for listening. And until next time. Thank you.